Is Amanda Knox guilty? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to continue the Amanda Knox series we started by getting all the case facts and learning about the case so we're all brought to the table. If you missed part one of the series, that's fine. We're actually going to recap everything here and bring you up to speed. So let's dig in. So what's the extent of the police evidence at this point? It includes the knife found at Raffaele Solecito's apartment that they believe could be the murder weapon. But they need more, so return to the crime scene. 46 days after the murder, they find Meredith's bra clasp under a mat. Using rubber gloves, they pick it up and inspect it. It will become the most controversial piece of evidence in the investigation. The defense will claim the delay in collecting it could have resulted in contamination. Investigators also, for the first time, use luminol to look for invisible bloodstains. Three clear footprints appear, plus other small bloodstains. More new evidence, but it will be controversial. In Seattle, the campaign to prove Amanda is innocent is underway. Her family turned to a crisis communications firm and a group called Friends of Amanda. It was just this kind of small group of people that were called the Americans in our offense. I think there was one quote that the Americans would send in the Marines to get Amanda Knox. I love Italy, I've been to Italy, and I have great respect for the courts. I do think we have a rogue prosecutor. In Italy, if you speak against the prosecution... As you'll remember from part one of this analysis, I think the Italian prosecutors have sort of lost the plot. I like what the Carabinieri did, where they thought the crime scene was staged. I also think it was staged, and I have something to say about that, actually, after I make this point. But I think the prosecutors are a little bit too conclusive about things that are not in evidence. For example, in part one, they said that it, it must have been three people together who stabbed Miranda to death. That's not necessarily true. One guy alone could easily overpower Miranda and stab her 40 times. That's not out of the question. It's happened uh, plenty of times, right? So that is totally plausible. However, these prosecutors seem to uh, be very convinced of things that are not in evidence. Also, regarding the staging of the crime scene, one reason I think it was staged is because the rock inside the bedroom that was allegedly used to break the window uh, was so big, it looked staged to me. It looked like someone set it there as a way to say, hey, police, make sure you see this, because this really means someone broke the window and climbed in through the window. And the fact that there was glass on top of the clothing, which means that the window was broken after the room had been ransacked. The other reason I thought the uh, crime scene was staged was because of the 911 call that Raphael made to the police. And in that call... He said something that was a red flag to me, but I think I made a mistake because I was focusing on the translation and not what was said in, in Italian. So I'm going to clarify this point and actually correct it. So in part one of this, of this uh, documentary, when Raphael called the police to report the crime, the translation said someone has entered the house and broken the window, which to me was a red flag because that would imply that Raphael knew someone had broken into the house already. Someone was already in the house and that they broke the window after they were already in the house. So he would have been leaking basically how the crime scene was staged. 
someone was in the house already. They took a rock, broke the window, set the rock on the ground. Strictly because of the order in which he said things. However, one of my Italian-speaking viewers actually wrote out what he said in Italian. And although I don't speak Italian, I do speak French and Spanish, the other romantic languages. And here's what Raphael actually said on the phone. Qualcuno è praticamente entrato in casa sfondado a la finestra. Finestra is window, like finestra, like in French. Uh, finestra. So, what does that mean? In Italian, the portion about the window came last, same as English. However, it makes sense in their grammar. Because when you translate that, it's someone practically entered the house by breaking the window, which is totally different than the um, translation we had in the first part of this documentary. So in other words, we're not going to hang so much importance onto that 911 call because according to the way it was originally said in Italian, it made sense. Someone entered the house by breaking the window which is totally different than saying someone was in the house and broke the window. So I'm going to retract that point from part one. We're not going to hang so much importance onto that 911 call. That 911 call uh, sounds good as far as that goes. However, pointing out the locked door, there were some other things that uh, sounded strange to me. Let's you keep should, listening. You can be prosecuted. So nobody can speak. And it, it's a perfect storm of a potentially very unfair prosecution. Amanda Knox's DNA has been found mixed together with Meredith Kircher's in five blood stains in the flat. Plus, tests show the bare footprints made in blood match the size and shape of Amanda's and her boyfriend's feet. And the bloody footprints are probably the most damning evidence so far. If they are, in fact, exact matches, that's the thing. They're saying they match the size and shape. Could these footprints belong to somebody else besides them? Yes. Could they even belong to, could the female looking ones actually belong to Miranda stumbling around bloody before she was finally killed? Yes. So the footprints, unless they're an exact match, don't tell us that Amanda and Raphael were there, right? It has to be an exact match. Also, the mixing of blood and DNA doesn't really tell us too much either because Amanda lived in that apartment. And the kitchen knife from Raffaele's apartment shows Amanda's DNA on the handle and a tiny trace of Meredith's DNA on the blade. As I said in the beginning, I liked the Italian police, the Carabinieri, thinking the crime scene was staged. I also think it was staged. However, some of this later forensics, I think they're being too conclusive with it. For example, this thing about the knife. If Raphael was really at the murder scene and he stabbed Miranda with that knife, would he wipe down the knife and walk it all the way back to his apartment? Or would he ditch it somewhere, throw it into a river, bury it, do anything but put it in his house to tie him to the crime scene? So the idea that he would have used that knife at Amanda's house, killed Meredith with it, and taken all the way home but made sure to scrub it down is implausible to me. Could it have happened? Yes. Is it likely that that's what he did? This guy's allegedly a college student, right? So is Amanda. I don't think anyone would make a mistake that, that dumb, no matter how panicked they were. Most people ditch murder weapons. So the evidence is probably not going to help us very much here. It's all going to boil down to the statements. And because Raphael speaks Italian, it's going to boil down to Amanda's statements. I think that is where we will get the truth. But right now, because this is such a complicated case, let's all get onto the same page. Let's keep watching. 
And let's just take these factors into mind. We're not going to rule anything out yet. Could Amanda be innocent? Yes. Could she be guilty? Yes. Could she and Raphael have done it together? Yes. Could neither of them have done it? Yes. Right. Could Raphael done it alone? Yes. Right. All the possibilities are open right now. A knife from Raphael's apartment shows Amanda's DNA on the handle and a tiny trace of Meredith's DNA on the blade. The clock spins forward almost one year to September 2008. Amanda Knox, Raffaele Solecito and Rudy Guede appear before a judge in Perugia. With so much publicity now surrounding Knox, Guede opts to be tried quickly and separately. I was convinced that if he had been tried with the others, that with all the international media... If you remember from part one, Rudy Guede is a guy whose fingerprints were found at the crime scene in Miranda's blood. That is good evidence tying him to the scene. Kind of like if the footprints were an exact match to Amanda, that would have tied her to the scene. But it's only the same size and shape. We don't know if it could have been Miranda's footprints. So do I think Rudy was involved? Yes. I also think he was involved because he fled the country. So he, they want us to believe, let's see what his lawyer, let's see what the exact defense is. Media clamor and the international pressure there would have been surrounding. This is Rudy's defense attorney talking right now. In this trial, they would have dumped all the blame on Rudy. So you have to see the role that money plays, even in the USA or even here, in your situation as a citizen or as a, as a, um, as a person, uh, as a suspect, right? Um, you're not, the justice system is not fair, no matter where you are, because money is going to play a role. The prosecution's case is a tabloid editor's dream. They say Amanda Knox, Raffaele Solecito and Rudy Guede killed Meredith Kircher in a sex game gone wrong. Guede denies this and pleads not guilty. His defense is that he wasn't in the room when Meredith was murdered. He was in the bathroom. Meredith had invited him over, he said. When he got there, Meredith was furious because money was missing and she was blaming Amanda. He says he comforted Meredith and things got physical, but they didn't have full sex. He went to the toilet, then says he heard Amanda enter the apartment. Lui ha sentito la voce di Amanda. He heard Amanda's voice as she came in. He was in the bathroom or just about to go into the bathroom. And then he really did put on his headphone and listen to music, rap, I think, at full volume, and then heard a scream. He came out and came up against a male figure. Rudy Guede says this man... Let's listen to the rest of this, but there's already a ton of red flags here. So let's listen to the rest of Rudy's alibi. And lunged at him with a knife, cutting his hand. The attacker then yelled, Black man found, black man condemned, and ran away. That is two on the nose. Guede found. So Rudy's alibi is that he was in the bathroom while... Uh, Miranda was getting murdered. We know from the evidence she was stabbed 40 times. And he allegedly did not hear that because he had his headphones in and was listening to music. Does that sound plausible to you? To me, it rings like a weak, fake alibi. It rings like a hoax, especially since he allegedly saw the killer, but the killer was wearing a mask and the killer basically told him in d directly, you're going to be the suspect, right? Black man found, black man convicted, right? This, so this murderer predicted the future and, and had his, his fall guy right in front of him actually told his fall guy that that's what happened. This does not sound plausible to me.
could it be true? Yes. Do I think it is? No. Am I, I would go all in that, that, that this is a fake alibi. The other reason I think it is fake is because let's say this actually happened. Rudy never called the police or the ambulance or anyone, right? What he did was he fled the country. He flew to Germany. He never reported anything to the police or emergencies to go check on uh, Miranda, right? This is allegedly someone that he was intimate with. They said that they were in bed together. She gets stabbed. He doesn't call anyone to help her. It's sort of like when Amanda threw her boss under the bus. If you're getting grilled by the police in interrogation and you're under duress and sleep deprivation and you're a little bit out of it, and you accuse someone else, that's actually forgivable. People actually confess to crimes they didn't commit to get out of that situation. However, to do that and then not recant when you're back in your right mindset is heartless. Most people, especially if they're innocent, appreciate just how bad that situation is because they were in it. So if they put someone else into it, they actually feel so bad, they will go correct themselves and say, you know what, I, I know I accused this guy, but I, I'm not sure if that actually happened. I, I made it up. She never recanted like that. Her boss had to go through, I think his name was Patrick, the entire process of exonerating himself before she admitted that she made it up. That was heartless. Patrick demonstrates, uh, I mean, Rudy demonstrates the same type of heartlessness. Even if we believe his story, let's say this alibi were true, which I don't think it is just based on the, the, the clear facts, just how absurd it is. Let's say it were true. A girl he was intimate with gets stabbed by a killer. He sees a killer. Even if he, he thought to himself, hey, the police are going to suspect me. This is dangerous. I can't, I can't call them right now. Even that is forgivable. But to not call even a few hours later, once you're out of panic mode, or even a day later, is the sign of heartlessness. And it's unbelievable. So we could forgive him if the story were true and he didn't call the police immediately. But to not call a few hours later without giving his name, all he had to do is go to a payphone and say, hey, a girl I know has been stabbed at this address. Can someone go check on her? That's what most normal people would do, non-psychopathic people would do. So even if we believe his alibi, which I don't, he still comes off as a psychopath, someone capable of, of committing this murder. Just based on how weak this alibi is, I think that he was definitely involved. Does that mean that Amanda and Rudy, uh, Amanda and Raphael are innocent? No. Amanda and Raphael could have still been involved. I do not have a concrete opinion on Amanda yet. I don't know if she did it or didn't do it yet. Right now, we're just collecting all the facts. They found Meredith bleeding in the other room. He tried to stem the blood flow with towels and left a bloody thumbprint on the pillowcase. But the bleeding didn't stop, and Guede says he panicked. Lui ha cercato di aiutarla. Right, so even if you panic and don't call the police, that is forgivable. But to not call at any point when you've seen a girl you're very close with, a friend of yours or your girlfriend, get stabbed to death, is it doesn't add up. It's not believable. He tried to help her. He took her in his arms and should have called for help, but he was scared and ran away, and he feels guilty for this. So his defense attorney is trying to make it seem like, well, he was panicked, so he didn't call the police. Fair enough. I'll allow that. But when you come to, most normal people would then call the ambulance or the police, even if they don't give their name. That's my point. So his attorney is, I'll, I'll forgive, is exonerating Rudy for not calling right away, which I'll forgive him for too. That's fair enough. The same way I forgive Amanda for throwing her boss into the bus when she was under duress. Fair enough. The red flag is in not correcting the error later. That is the sign of a truly heartless person. In Amanda's case, I'm not sure if she was involved or not, but not 
pulling her boss out from under the bus after she threw him under it is heartless. Rudy, I think, did it, and his alibi is weak, which would explain everything. Rudy Guede is found guilty of Meredith's murder and sentenced to 30 years. Good. Now the question is, did he do it alone? That's the big question. That is what has intrigued people about this case for years. The judge's verdict says Rudy Guede did not act alone. He's led away to prison. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito will now stand trial for the murder and sexual assault of Meredith Kircher. January the 16th, 2009. The trial begins. The world's media is focused on Amanda Knox. Her face fills the front pages. Could this attractive, bubbly, all-American girl be capable of murder? As they did at Rudy Guede's trial, the prosecution again suggests the murder was the result of a sex game gone wrong. Again, this is strongly denied. Amanda and Raffaele claim they weren't in the house that night. To support their case, the prosecution produces evidence they claim places the couple at the scene of the murder. First, there's the DNA found in the bathroom. The prosecution says it shows the mixed blood of Amanda Knox and Meredith Kircher in the B-Day drain, the sink drain, and on a cotton bud box. Does the mixed blood mean Amanda was there when the crime was committed? No. If she and Miranda both flossed and had bloody gums, there would be blood in the sink. right? Amanda lived in the house with Miranda. This doesn't prove much. It just proves that she was in the house at some point. There is also a large drop of Amanda's blood on the bathroom tap. According to the prosecutor, this shows Amanda and Meredith were bleeding at the same time. Strong evidence there was a fight. The principal evidence was mixed blood traces from which were extracted mixed DNA of Amanda and Meredith. The only explanation for that mix is that Amanda was bleeding and touched objects that were covered in Meredith's blood. One thing I don't like about these prosecutors, same thing I don't like about hoaxers, is their conclusiveness is the only way that Amanda and Miranda's blood mixing, the only way is that uh, Amanda had to murder her for their blood to mix? No. There's dozens of explanations why two girls living in the same house could have their blood mixed in the bathroom. Like I said in part one of this analysis, this is all going to boil down to us listening and analyzing Amanda's statement because we cannot rely on these Italian prosecutors. I think they're too, they have too much tunnel vision on Amanda. They might actually like the headlines. This thing about the sexcapade, is there any evidence of a, of a sex, of an orgy? No, not from what I've seen here. So I don't trust the prosecutors. And as far as the evidence collection goes, I feel like the forensics team drop the ball. The only Italian police I think who did a good job were the Carabinieri when they showed up and immediately said, just like I did, that this crime scene looks staged. That I believe. I believe the crime scene was staged after the murder, particularly because of the big rock that was used to allegedly break the window. It was too big. It was too much persuasion. And the fact that there was glass on top of the clothing, which means that after the room was ransacked, then the window was broken. There's no other explanation. But Amanda's lawyers say this proves nothing. 
Whenever someone says there's no other explanation for something, that's a red flag. That's a failure of imagination. It means they're not imagining. They don't have a good enough imagination. And I see this a lot in my uh, McCann's series in the comments. Well, if they killed uh, Madeline, how could they have disposed of the body in that time period? It's a failure of imagination. What if they stored the body and then took it to the water? Or what if she died before, like some people theorize, and then they dumped the body beforehand? Uh, or hid the body, then dumped it? There's a million ways, or they did it really quickly, right? There's a million ways that something can happen. And the analogy I use is the magic trick. Just because you don't know how the magic trick was done doesn't mean magic exists. You're just, you might not be thinking about an obvious thing the magician is doing to create the illusion or to pull off the trick. And I think that these Italian prosecutors are demonstrating a lack of imagination. They have too much tunnel vision on their explanation. As we saw in part one, they're adamant that three people had to have attacked Miranda because she knew a karate. Not so. She could be the best female MMA fighter in the world. A guy half the size of Rudy could overpower her and stab her 40 times with ease. Two young students living together means it's perfectly normal to find mixed blood and DNA in the bathroom. They say it's possible Amanda's DNA isn't from her blood at all, but from her saliva. Sarah Gino is the forensic biologist on Amanda Knox's defense. Amanda's defense team is making the exact same points that I made. This is all interesting evidence, but none of it is conclusive. And to act otherwise is disingenuous. Defense team. In this case, the test was done for blood. But was the test done for saliva? No. So we can't know if inside that mixed trace there was blood because it had been demonstrated, or just saliva. Or maybe... There was blood from both of them. But what does that mean? Maybe someone had a bloody nose one time, and then at another moment someone cut their finger and put it down, and their blood got mixed. Exactly. Or like I said, they could both have bloody gums and brush their teeth in that sink and spit, and one hits the sink and the other one also hits, you know, hits the tap, and the other one hits the tap with their spit. As you saw from the video of their house, they're not particularly cleanly. These are college students living in a house together, a bunch of them. The, the house was not particularly clean. It's not like they were scrubbing down the sink every night so that that blood had to come from the night of the murder. It was the exact opposite. The house was very messy. Then there was the kitchen knife found in Raffaele Sollecito's flat. This, say the prosecutors, is the murder weapon, which has been cleaned. But they have found DNA of Amanda Knox on the handle and a minuscule amount of Meredith Kircher's DNA on the blade. Like I said earlier, would he, Raphael take the knife that he used to stab Miranda to death and take it on the bus or walk it all the way to his house only to wipe it down and put it back in his, um, back in the drawer? right back in his utensils drawer. That's totally counter intuitive if he was actually a murderer, right? These are college students. The most likely thing someone would do with the murder weapon is either wipe it down and leave it at the scene or dispose of it. They want us to believe that he transported it from the, from the murder scene all the way to his house. So not only does it end up at his house, but he has to transport it there himself. But then he has enough forethought to wipe it down and make it really clean. It's, it doesn't make sense. Is it possible? Yes, of course, right? We're leaving all possibilities open. But is it likely that a college student, someone with a decent IQ, would think to himself, hey, I just used this to murder someone. Let me go take it all the way to my house so I can tie myself to the scene. But the words, too low, are written on the DNA reports for the knife. The test should never have been carried out, say defense. 
there's not enough reliable DNA. When questioned by journalists, the prosecution stands by its forensic evidence. It is not too little. The genetic profile is low, but it is absolutely reliable. In fact, we were able to get it, which means there is no uncertainty about the attribution of that profile to the victim. More DNA evidence is presented, this time on Meredith's bra clasp. Police say Raffaele Solecito's DNA is on one of the hooks. This is the only evidence placing him in her bedroom. So, Raphael's DNA is on Meredith's bra clasp. Does that place him at the scene of the crime? No. A bra is an article of clothing. It's not a fixture in the room. If Miranda was wearing that bra in the living room two days prior and he came over to visit Amanda and hugged her, his DNA could end up on the bra clasp. And if she didn't throw it in the laundry for two days and happened to be wearing it on the night she was murdered, his DNA would end up on the bra clasp. All the evidence we've seen so far in this little montage of, their, of the best pieces of evidence are very weak. A bra is not a fixture in the room. It, it moves around. So does this actually place him at the crime scene? No. Does this mean he's innocent? No. Does it mean Amanda's innocent? No. All, every possibility is still open at this point. And I think that's why this case is going to be fascinating and why this series is going to be interesting because it's all go going to boil down to Amanda's statements. And Amanda, from what I've seen, is very intelligent, very cold, and likely a very sophisticated liar if she is lying. So I think our analysis of her is going to be one of the most sophisticated analyses we've done. If you want to make sure to get updates as we add videos to this series, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and save this playlist. And make sure to check out my other playlists. This DD person McCann's is very popular. Also, because we're analyzing a documentary in this video, this video, like part one of this series, is going to be demonetized. So if you want to support the channel, uh, please consider becoming a member of the channel. You get a little badge to show your progression as a deception detector. And you get uh, unique emojis that you can use in the live chat when we premiere the videos. And I just added this one today, the bingo emoji, which we can use in the live chat when someone says something correct and calls out a good point. With that said, back to the video. There is no DNA evidence that puts Amanda in the room. David Balding, a DNA statistician at University College London, is recognized as one of the world's leading analysts. In 2012, he is asked by the Italian Forensic Association to study Meredith Kircher's bra clasp and to give an independent view on whether Solecito's DNA is present. His findings are not part of the court case. When you just look at the evidence by eye, you can see very strongly all of Raffaella Selecito's DNA types are there, and that can't be explained by any kind of just environmental contamination. And I calculate how likely is the evidence under the prosecution assertion that, that DNA is there from Raffaella Selecito, and again, how likely it is without him being present, and the, the former is much greater than the latter. So that's when I say that's extremely strong evidence. It's strong evidence that Raphael had interaction with Miranda's bra. It does not mean he was in the room the night she was murdered. It means he could have given her a hug at any point in time. As long as she didn't wash her bra, his DNA would be on it. But forensic experts representing the defense remain adamant that the bra clasp had been contaminated and is unreliable. That's another possibility. This was picked up something like 40 days later, right? Contamination is totally possible when you have a forensics team that is this sloppy. As far as the bra clasp is concerned, what happened? This bra clasp was collected 46 days after the first crime scene inspection, and a mixture of biological material was found. 
There was a profile attributable to the victim, which is normal, and other material that was attributable to Raffaele Solecito. There were other traces, but they were not attributed to anyone. But of course, the history of that bra clasp is a bit unusual because it lay in the room for many days uh, without being collected, and so people are worried about the possibility of contamination arising from that. I can't say anything directly because I wasn't there and I don't know the circumstances about the risk of contamination, but what I can say uh, is that contamination of DNA from passers-by is not an issue. We, I've taken that into account in my... The, the, the chance of it matching Selecito's DNA is extremely unlikely. The defence also uses the crime scene video to question the DNA evidence presented by the prosecution. I have looked at the crime scene. The videos, bloody shoe prints, cleaned up, cleaned up, not saved. A bra strap um, collected weeks and weeks and weeks after the initial collection that now supposedly connects Amanda, Raffaele, and Meredith. But the prosecution keeps producing evidence they say connects Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito to the crime scene. Amanda's footprints, which were revealed by the luminol, show DNA attributed to Meredith, which means Amanda was walking in bare feet, covered in blood. Has it been proven? We're talking about bloody footprints with Miranda's DNA in the house. Miranda is someone who was stabbed and bleeding. I just want to know, has it been proven that these were not Miranda's footprints? And I can already picture the comments of people saying, well, so you're saying you don't think Amanda did it? You think Amanda's innocent? No. I'm leaving all possibilities open, but I want to know what needs to be narrowed down. If these are in fact Amanda's footprints and that's proven, then we can place Amanda at the crime scene, at least walking around in the blood. But if it's not proven that these are exactly her footprints, like I said earlier, my best guess is these are probably just Miranda's footprints, stumbling around bleeding before finally being finished off in the bedroom. As far as I'm concerned, all options are open, except for Rudy. I think Rudy was definitely involved. And he may have done it alone. That's the big question. They argue this is proof the couple came back during the night to clean up and stage the break-in, leaving blood-stained footprints in the bathroom and corridor. The defense says there is no proof the prints actually were bloodstains. The luminol may have revealed another substance, such as bleach. The prosecution also presents evidence to challenge the couple's story of what they did that night. And Wow, so even if the footprints are proven to be Amanda's, it still doesn't mean she was walking around in Miranda's blood. It could have been bleach. For example, if they were cleaning the floors one day and Amanda accidentally stepped, walked across it barefoot. That would show up in the luminal. Like I said from the very beginning, this case is crazy because of all the different ways the evidence points. It's going to boil down to the statements. Make sure to subscribe and add this playlist so that you're, you get notified when we do the premieres of this next pieces of this series. Because I think this is going to be a good one. Let's keep watching. Let's get the full picture and the next morning. They show Raffaele's cell phone was turned on at 6.02 a.m. Despite their claim, they slept until 10. Then, there was the telephone call to the Carabinieri, when Solecito knew nothing had been stolen and failed to mention the postal police were... That was one thing he said, which was a red flag. So, although we've... This comment makes me feel better about the order with the window and someone being inside the house. It seems like that was normal. There were other red flags in that 911 call. One of which was his conclusiveness that nothing had been stolen. 
how would he know that unless he had cataloged everything? You, you couldn't know that. And he said that the room to Miranda's door, uh, the door to Miranda's room was locked. So how could he know that nothing in her room was stolen? Basically, his conclusiveness about nothing being stolen suggests information, him knowing information outside the facts that we have, which makes me suspicious of him. Does that mean he murdered Miranda? No. Does it mean he might know something? He might be trying to hide something else? Yes. So Raphael and Amanda, of course, are still suspects. We're at the scene. They also question Raffaele Solecito's changing alibi and present eyewitnesses who contradict Knox and Solecito's stories. In court, the prosecution accuses Amanda Knox of being the leader of a sexual attack on Meredith. They say this was payback for Meredith's disapproval of Amanda's lifestyle. The erotic game was always part of the case. I think that night, Amanda wanted to make Meredith pay for judging her, which she found offensive. Girl from Seattle that worked three jobs to get to Italy to study abroad, an honor student from Seattle Prep, doesn't overnight in my experience, turn in to a depraved murderess overnight. The court's claims make difficult hearing for the Knox family. Obviously, listening to uh, those types of things were, you know, it's horrible. And I mean, it was an all-out attack on her character by individuals that have no idea who she truly is as a person. One of the things that we have tried to... Regarding Amanda's character... Do I think she's an angel? No. Do I think she's demonic? No. We don't know enough about her yet. We haven't heard any statements. So even if she is promiscuous or didn't like Miranda, that does not mean that she murdered Miranda. And the type of murder as is extremely gruesome and violent. 40 stab wounds is uh, not a roommate domestic argument got gone wrong, in my opinion. To do this entire time is, is obviously support Amanda uh, by always having somebody over here, somebody to visit her and stuff like that. And we have to stay strong in order for her to stay strong. June the 12th, 2009. Amanda Knox spends two days on the stand to tell her version of the story. Millions worldwide watch her explanation of why she put the pub owner, Patrick Lumumba, in the frame. They told me that I was trying to protect someone. So here we have Amanda in court explaining why she threw her boss under the bus. And like I said it from part one. It is forgivable in the circumstances she was in, the panic, etc., to suggest someone else did it just to get yourself out of the situation of being questioned. However, not recanting, not correcting the record later is heartless. So I don't think she's an angel by any stretch of the imagination, but that also doesn't make her a murderer. What it does is it tells us she has the capability of sacrificing someone's life. If he had been convicted, would she have come forward? We don't know. But she put him in the position where that could have happened. He could have been convicted of murder based on her word. And she never corrected it, even later in time when she would have not been under duress any longer, when she'd had sleep and been able to think clearly. So what she says here, I think will be a reasonable explanation for why she threw him under the bus. But what cannot be reasonably explana- explained is why she never corrected the record. That was heartless. But I wasn't trying to protect anyone. 
and they continued to put so much emphasis e continuavano a mettere così tanta enfasi on this message that I had received from Patrick sul messaggio che avevo ricevuto da Patrick and so e quindi I almost was Io convinced quasi that I had ero convinta him. che l'avevo incontrato her case is this she was at Raffaele's house when the murder happened watching a movie and reading her emails they stopped watching the film at 9.30 She can't prove it because two of their three computers were damaged when police tried to search the hard drives. Throughout the year-long trial, Meredith's family fly in from London to testify and witness the key hearings. They try to keep the focus on Meredith and their quest for justice. The 3rd of December, 2009, the eve of the verdict. Amanda's family arrives to hear her plea for freedom. She knows that she's innocent and has had nothing to do with this, and we're just uh, very hopeful that uh, the court will see and be able to see that in the evidence that's been presented. Amanda is now almost fluent in Italian. Io non sono calma. So I'm going to translate. This is Amanda speaking Italian now. Presented. Amanda is now almost fluent in Italian. Io non sono I am not calm. No calma. Um, in questi giorni, a few days ago, I wrote on a piece of paper in front of me that I was afraid of losing myself. Io scritto su un foglio davanti a me che avevo paura di perdere me stessa. E cioè... I am scared of having the mask of a murderer forced on my skin. This is weird language, but then again, it's in Italian. We're going to have to analyze her English statements. Ho paura di avere una maschera di assassina forzata sulla mia pelle. The 4th of December, 2009. 323 days since the trial started. The verdict is broadcast around the world. So now we have the judge. This court finds Knox, Amanda, and Solesito Raffaele guilty of the crimes they are accused of. So they are convicted in the first trial. Guilty of murder. 25 years for Raffaele Sollecito and 26 for Amanda Knox, the extra year for slandering Patrick Lumumba. The Kircher's Italian lawyer is satisfied. The failed alibis, the behavior of Sollecito and Knox's statements, the slander of Patrick Lumumba. Here's the thing with um, Kircher, Miranda Kircher's lawyer. He's right. Throwing Patrick under the bus was bad. The weak, the changes in the alibi is suspicious. But that does not necessarily mean that they murdered Miranda. It could be that they were doing drugs at the house when Rudy was there and they don't want to be caught for using hard drugs. Um, or some other thing that they're trying to hide, right? All possibilities are still open. We can't be as conclusive as these Italian prosecutors are at this point. We don't have that smoking gun that ties Amanda to the scene. And this is really similar to the McCann's. There's no smoking gun. My opinion, which is very firm, is based on the interviews of the McCann's. However, the case facts there were much more simple. This one's more complicated with more characters, which is why we're setting up this series this way. So we're all on the same page before we dig into Amanda's statements. Like I said, I think they'll reveal the truth, but if she is lying to me, she looks and sounds like a sophisticated liar, if she is one. I've never analyzed any of her statements before. 
These are all elements that once put together allow the determination of guilt. But Knox's family keeps tight-lipped as they leave the courtroom. Push back. Push back. Press, press, stop it. When they return to Seattle, they immediately start preparing her appeal. There's not one piece of physical evidence to link this girl to this crime. They draft legal, forensic and political consultants from the US and Italy to strengthen the defense team. It takes a year to get to the appeal. November the 24th, 2010. By now, Knox and Solecito have been in jail for three years. This time there is a new judge and a new prosecutor, Giancarlo Costaiola. Despite the fact that there had already been a conviction, the deputy judge said at the beginning of the hearing that the only thing that was certain was that a girl was dead. I agree. It looks like we finally have some Italian law enforcement, prosecutor, or judiciary who, who are being honest about this, who don't have that tunnel vision. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito's defense teams decide to focus on Rudy Guede. They call prison inmates, convicted criminals, to testify that Guede has confessed to them in prison. June the 27th, 2011. Rudy Guede takes the stand. By now, after an appeal, his sentence has been cut from 30 to 16 years. He denies he made a jailhouse confession and is asked about a letter he has written claiming Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito killed Meredith. We have, I'm going to translate this, so Guede being questioned in court. And so, Mr. Guede, when you write that it was a horrible murder of a splendid, marvelous girl that was Meredith, by Raffaele Solecito and Amanda Knox, what did you mean to say exactly? Did you say this before? We have Rudy accusing Amanda and Raphael. Does that sound like a hoax? Yes, because if he's trying to claim that he was not there, right? His story was that he was in the bathroom when uh, Miranda was murdered, and that when he came out, he saw a masked man with a knife. How would he know, A, that that was Raphael, and B, that Amanda was also involved, if his alibi were true? He's being too conclusive. He's basically trying to point the finger at anyone by himself, and right now he's the only person I'm convinced was involved in the murder. I wrote it because it's a thought that's always been inside me. But then it's not true. And then Guede, no, it's very true. Too conclusive. Too conclusive for his story. Sounds like a hoax. The key focus of the appeal is on the DNA. Knox and Kircher's DNA on the knife. Solecito's on the bra clasp. Is it enough to place the defendants at the crime scene or not? The court appoints independent experts Carla Vecchiotti and Stefano Conti from the University of Sapienza, Rome, to review the science. Their report is scathing about prosecution forensic methods. They cite 
U.S. manuals and standards, highlighting errors made when the evidence was collected. They do find a new trace of DNA on the knife from Solecito's kitchen that hasn't been tested. However, they argue, it's too small to be of use. This report helps the judge focus his decision on whether there is reasonable doubt about the DNA samples. For Meredith's mother and the rest of her family, the hearings are agonizing. The good thing about what we're doing here is we don't need to, right, in court you can only present evidence that's admissible and then to prove someone's guilty has to be beyond reasonable doubt. Here we can look at all evidence. It doesn't just have to be court admissible. We can look at anything we want on my channel. And we're just betting our poker chips. Something doesn't have to be beyond reasonable doubt for us to form the opinion that someone is guilty or someone's innocent. But in court, it's a standard of reasonable doubt. And as far as I'm concerned, the Italians do not have that on Amanda. So even though Amanda Knox was eventually exonerated by the Italian court, that doesn't necessarily mean that my opinion, our opinion here on the channel, is going to be that she's innocent. Because at this point, I also agree. There is not enough evidence to link her to the murder. It does not rise to um, the standard of convicting her of a criminal in a criminal case. Does that mean she didn't do it? No. It just means you can't prove it in court. And I agree. The evidence the Italians presented was not strong enough. If I were on the jury, I would also say she's not guilty. Everything that Meredith must have felt that night, everything she went through, the fear and and the terror and not knowing why. Um, and she didn't deserve that. No one deserves that. October the 3rd, 2011. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito await their fate for the second time. Here we have the judge of the Court of Appeals giving his verdict. And he's acquitting Amanda and Raffaele of the crimes. So he's saying that they are not guilty. Not guilty. Was that the correct verdict? I think so, based on what we've seen so far. The evidence was totally circumstantial. Does that mean she didn't do it? No. Sort of like O.J. Simpson. He was found, he was acquitted, he was found not guilty. But if you look at my analysis of O.J. Simpson, I am 100% convinced that he is guilty. So we can't necessarily just take the standard of proof in a criminal proceeding is so high that even if someone's found guilty, it does not necessarily mean they didn't do it. It just means it could not be proved in the court of law to the high standard that's required to convict someone. There is sufficient doubt for Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito to be released immediately. I'm Deanna Knox, Amanda Knox's sister, and I just have a few words on behalf of our family. We're thankful that Amanda's nightmare is over. She suffered for four years for a crime that she did not commit. That Raffaele had nothing to do with the murder of that poor girl, Meredith Kircher, who remains in our hearts. Not necessarily so. So this is Raphael's father saying Raphael had nothing to do with it. It just means it couldn't be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Raphael may still have had something to do with it. And that is what we are going to figure out on my channel once we start getting into the statements. Let's wrap up this video. There's just a few minutes left. Let's see if there's any more twists. There's been plenty of twists in this story.
Some in the gathering crowd become increasingly agitated about the verdict. There were people out on the stairs in front of the courthouse, and for a long time they yelled, shame on you. That's one thing about getting to the truth. You can't be emotional. emotional emotion does not factor into it. You can't let the crowd sway you one way or the other. A dark sedan ferries Amanda Knox away to a safe house deep in the Italian countryside for an emotional reunion with relatives after almost four years in jail. While Meredith's family is left stunned and pained by the acquittal. Les has been almost forgotten in all of it. The media photos can't... I just don't understand. They have Rudy in jail for the murder. Why are they convinced that Amanda had something to do with it? None of the evidence was satisfactory to me. It's all going to boil down to the statements. And even body language is not useful. They might think, hey, Amanda looks cold. She sounds psychopathic. She was doing cartwheels in the police station. None of that proves anything. If she didn't go to the memorial service, so what? That doesn't make her a murderer. I know it sounds like I'm defending Amanda a lot, but the truth is I don't know whether she's guilty or not yet. I haven't analyzed her statements. And my point here is that I'm not going to base my opinion on anything but the statements. How these statements, the statements she makes, relate to the facts. She can do all the cartwheels she wants. She can make all the um, weird facial expressions she wants. It's not going to affect my opinion. But people do get swayed by that stuff and then they end up making mistakes. There's not a lot about what actually happened in the beginning. Um, so it's very difficult to kind of keep her memory alive in all of this. The media's photos will be of Amanda Knox arriving home at Seattle Airport. I'm, I'm really overwhelmed right now. Um, I was looking down from the airplane and it seemed like everything wasn't real. Um, what's important for me to say is just thank you to everyone who's believed in me, who's defended me, who's supported my family. Um, Amanda finds a home in Seattle's International District and returns to the University of Washington to study creative writing. She starts writing a book about her experience, reportedly receiving a $4 million advance, although claims that all of the money goes on legal expenses. Back in Italy, Rudy Guede is still in prison, where he has been beaten up by inmates. He has Tough. I think he did it. Just don't know if he did it alone. He's begun studying to build himself a future and will soon be eligible for parole. For a while, this seems like the end of the story. But fate or the Italian justice system... I knew there was another twist in this story. ...system has another couple of twists in store. Now it's the turn of the prosecution to appeal. And on the 26th of March 2013, Italy's highest court, known as the Court of Cassation, orders a new trial, overturning Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito's acquittals. They say the first appeal did not debate many of the 10,000 pages from the first trial, focusing too much on the DNA evidence. September. This is why I'm interested in what evidence is going to reconvict them because I know there were multiple trials and she eventually ended up being exonerated. But what evidence do they use here to convict her? 
because that's probably going to be the evidence she ad- has to address in future interviews about this. September the 30th, 2013. The second appeal begins. This time, the drama switches to the birthplace of the Renaissance, Florence. Amanda Knox isn't in the courtroom. She refuses to travel from America and defends her decision on television. I don't blame her. I wouldn't show up either. Her not flying to Italy to be retried, it does not mean she's guilty. It's the smart thing to do. Only Raffaele Solecito is present in court. He makes a plea to the judge and jury. I ask you humbly to look at the reality of this whole matter. And to consider that a big error has been made. Unlike in the appeals court, this judge orders a police forensics lab in Rome to test the new trace of DNA found on the kitchen knife. It's a minuscule amount from where the blade meets the handle. The new test finds that the DNA matches Amanda Knox. Prosecutors say it further proves her involvement in the murder. But the defense says the most likely explanation is that Amanda used the knife when staying at Raffaele's apartment. Exactly. This, this is getting weak now. I'm surprised this evidence is so weak. I'm more and more convinced just by watching this that Rudy did it alone. But we can't rule out Amanda and Raphael. We have to hear Amanda's statement about it, see if there's any leakage. But right now, this the Italian case is, is weak. The 30th of January, 2014. Six years and two months after Meredith Kircher's murder, the second appeal of Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito is coming to a close. The judgment watched by the world. Solecito doesn't wait to hear the verdict, speeding off in a taxi. Amanda Knox stays in the United States, plagued by the same fear she shared on television. Shortly after 9.30 p.m. local time, after deliberating for more than 12 hours, the judge and jury enter the hall. So here we have the Court of Appeals giving their verdict. The penale contro Nox Amanda Marie, sollecito Raffaele, ridetermina la pena. And they're reconvicting them. They sentence Amanda to 28 years and six months in Italian prison. Good thing she didn't fly back to Italy. Ne inflitta Nox Amanda Marie complessivamente in anni 28 e mesi 6 di reclusione. Conferma nel resto l'impugnata sentenza. This time, an even longer sentence. 28 years and 6 months for Amanda Knox, 25 years. The fact that they added extra years, so it's actually punitive. They're punishing her for winning the prior appeals case. I think there's just too much emotion in this Italian court system. Too much pride on the line, too much of the prosecution wanting to be correct. I think that, uh, unfortunately, is the case here. The tacking on extra years is is the red flag here, that that they're not being totally objective. Here's for Raffaele Solecito. The lawyers give their verdict. This trial has been media-driven. Everything has been amplified. These kids were taken to prison four days after the body was found. They were the first suspects and never lost that image. I think, so this is Raphael's mother speaking. I think she's exactly correct. The prosecutors had tunnel vision. That's something I say a lot on my channel and on my ex account. You have to escape binary thinking. You can't 
you have to be able to be flexible. If, if I, for example, I've updated my analysis on the channel. You've seen me say someone cheated and then I actually changed my mind in a future video. And that's how you avoid making mistakes. If your goal is to get to the truth, you cannot be afraid of changing your opinion. If I change my opinion on the McCanns, for example, which I really don't think I will, but let's say I see something that blows my mind and forces me to change my opinion, I will publicly say it and take whatever fallout comes. However, I don't see that happening. From what I've seen the McCanns, I'm convinced. But for example, let's say like here in my playlist of false accusers, let's say I see something with a Marilyn Manson accuser uh, where I think, well, hey, hey, now they're telling the truth. I'll update my analysis. And I think the Italian prosecutors were not willing to do that. And they ended up... We don't know if Amanda Knox was involved, nor do we know if Raphael was involved. But from the evidence we've seen here, was there reasonable doubt? Yes. And I think the fact that they convicted them, based on the evidence we've seen here, there's plenty of reasonable doubt. If it was a media-driven trial, it's not due to the Kirscher family, who have been absolutely silent. So if we're talking about a media circus, we need to look at the behavior of the suspects and their followers. In court, the victim of Amanda Knox's original slander, Patrick Lumumba, is relieved. He's been awarded 40,000 euros compensation. Life has changed a lot, but when you have obtained justice, like this evening, you feel more encouraged to start all over again. Raffaele Soletito has disappeared, but the next day police find him 250 miles away at a hotel near the Austrian border. They confiscate his passport. His lawyers say he wasn't trying to flee the country. He remained... At that point, even if he were, I wouldn't blame him. ...and free until his final appeal. In other words, him fleeing after that verdict does not mean that he actually murdered Miranda. I think even an innocent person would flee. It reminds me of Carlos Ghosn, the Nissan CEO of fleeing from Japan. I think he was totally innocent. But once you recognize that the court system is not being objective anymore, then fleeing is your best option. And the story of Carlos Ghosn, if you don't know that one, is, is fascinating. If you want to look it up, Carlos G-H-O-S-N. Anybody losing anyone close to them is hard. Losing somebody so young and the way that we did um, is, is obviously a, a hundred times worse. And then on top of that, to have all the, the, the media attention that has gone on for so long just makes it very, very difficult to cope with. I think we all definitely want some form of closure. I'll even just having it almost at an end of the Italian justice system and knowing that that's the final decision um, and then we can all start to remember just Meredith rather than focusing on who did it or what happened. The day of the final appeal came yet another year later on the 25th of March 2015, seven and a half years from when Meredith was brutally murdered in the hillside cottage in Perugia. Italy's Supreme Court of Cassation was called upon to decide whether or not to uphold the guilty verdict. With no cameras allowed in court, the media camped out on the stairs of the imposing palace of the Supreme Court, interviewing lawyers as they came and went. Amanda Knox's lawyers argued her Florence conviction was a grave judicial error, while Raffaele Solecito's lawyers likened him to Forrest Gump. Those familiar with the story of Forrest Gump know he is an innocent to whom gigantic, crazy things happen. After a day and a half of final arguments, the panel of five judges retired to deliberate. Journalists and legal observers reflected on the possible outcomes. Amanda Knox and her family awaited the decision in Seattle, while Raffaele Solecito 
went back home to Bari. After 10 hours of deliberation, shortly before 11 p.m., the final verdict was pronounced. The guilty verdict was sensationally overturned. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito were cleared of all charges. I think the Supreme Court made the right decision. The case was not proven beyond a reasonable doubt. This doesn't, this verdict does not mean Amanda Knox innocent, Raphael innocent. It just means the case was not proven to the standard of a criminal proceeding. And to determine whether or not they're actually guilty, that will be our job because we can look at evidence that's not court admissible. We're going to analyze their own statements and it's going to be an opinion, what we're betting our chips on. So it can be 50-50. If it's 51% she's guilty, then I'm going to say my opinion is she's guilty. Except for Amanda's slander of Patrick Lumumba. I'm incredibly grateful for what has happened, for the justice I've received. We must no longer suggest any possible involvement of Raffaele Sollecito. Enough, enough, enough. Francesco Maresca, the Kircher's lawyer, was stunned as well. The final word came with Friday's verdict that declared the innocence of the two accused, although it did refer to the second clause of Article 530, which relates to insufficient evidence. Just like I said, that's what they need to leave them off. That's, that's what got them off. It's a correct decision. There was not enough evidence to convict them. So here we have Raphael giving a statement. It was unbearable. Not only was I put in jail for four years, but I was also called an assassin. They All right, so in the end, like I said, they were found not guilty by the uh, Italians. Now our job begins, so make sure to subscribe. Add this playlist so you get the updates of this series. And the next video is going to be a statement analysis of Amanda, who I think is going to be, if she is lying, a very sophisticated liar. And I will actually send that video, the one I'm going to analyze, to members early so that uh, members are able to perform their own analysis. And then when we premiere the video, you'll be able to give me your commentary in the live stream um, at the same time as the video is premiering to see if our analysis matched up. I think that's going to be fun. That's a great idea. Um, until next time, stay true.